Hello, I hope you're well. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to today's video which is my June wrap up. Now I'm feeling pretty chuffed about June, not gonna lie. I was a little concerned because to be quite honest, May felt a little bit slumpy based on the number of books that I was able to read and kind of my enjoyment level from from them overall. There were some gems in May, don't get me wrong, but there was one book that kind of hung over my head and has overshadowed the entire month. However, June was great. I had a lot of fun reading. I read a lot of books. I read 10 books total, which is not only above like my average number of books per month, which I think is around six to eight, like I surpassed that, but I also was able to like double the number of books that I had read in May. I think I read five books in, way in May, now I've read ten books in June, not to mention the fact that two of these books are tomes. One is over a thousand pages and one is over 500 pages. So lots of reading, lots of fun, I was trying to do a bunch of things at once and I'm ready to like gush, gush effusively about some of them to you, so why don't we just dive right in. Okay, so the first books that I want to talk about are the books that I read for Pride Month, which didn't actually appear on my June TBR, partly because at the time I was filming I only had like a vague idea of the books that I wanted to read, and I figured this would give me the opportunity to mood read a little bit in June. As much as I love TBRs and giving myself like goals to work towards, I also like to give myself a little bit of flexibility. So I ended up reading three books for Pride, and the first book that I want to talk about is Carol by Patricia Highsmith, which I feel like most people know about now because of the movie that came out a few years ago starring Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara. This is actually the movie tie-in cover because I went and saw the movie when it was first in theaters, really really enjoyed it, and decided that I would want to read the book as well, but had never gotten around to doing it. But I kind of knew I wanted to read this this pride because this is like a, considered like a seminal work within the LGBTQ plus canon because considering when this book was written which I believe is in the 1950s the ending is not what you would expect and that's why it is kind of this really interesting piece of like the LGBTQ plus fiction or queer fiction category. The story itself is about this young girl, Therese, and over the Christmas season or holiday she's working at this like Macy's-like department store when in walks Carol of the title, this wealthy um, housewife, <laughs> for lack of a better term, who is there to buy a gift for her daughter. And the two of them end up having this love affair and the story follows them during the first blushes of their romance on a road trip across America and is really this interesting story that is part coming of age story when it comes to Therese and really just about the lives of these two women that are very sort of stagnant. Like, Therese is not satisfied necessarily with how her career is going or her love life before this. Carol is in this like stultifying marriage and so they both, they're both searching for something and they find that something in each other and there was something about this book, something about the writing, I listened to it as an audiobook mind you, but there was just something that really touched me, spoke to me, I thought it was really really beautiful. Um, I wouldn't say that either character is particularly likable. Like Therese at the beginning of this book is very very immature, like uncomfortably so, and so yes she matures over the course of the book which is why I think that it is in large part a coming of age story of her and how this relationship with Carol helps her to grow in confidence and in her understanding of herself, but also Carol can be a little bit domineering and can lash out for seemingly no reason, so she's not necessarily all that likable either, 
But there's something about this book, something about the relationship between them and everything that they go through in this setting because it is written and set like in the 1950s that was just like wow. Now when I first finished reading this book I did give it a 4 or 4.5 rating and I continued to think about it over the course of the month so I ended up actually going back into Goodreads and upping this to a 5 star review. So I highly recommend it. It was really really good. The book is slightly different from the movie as one would expect but I think both are worth note. The next book that I read for Pride was When Katie Met Cassidy by Camille Perry and it was honestly delightful. Like I had such a fun time with this. I basically listened to the entire audiobook in a day. Like I had so much fun. So so much fun. So the book is essentially about Katie and Cassidy, obviously, and at the beginning of the book Katie has been engaged to a man and has just basically called off that engagement. And so she's still reeling from that experience and everything that has tri transpired because of it. But both she and Cassidy are attorneys negotiating the same contract, which is how they come into each other's orbits. And since this is a romance, obviously a romance blossoms. But there's a lot going on in addition to the romance that I think added something to the story. On Katie's part, Katie has gone through her life thinking that she is straight. And now she's come to this realization that she likes women, loves women, is sexually attracted to women, especially Cassidy, and she has to kind of come to terms with that and what that means for her and her life. And this is a character who has a lot of internalized homophobia that she also has to work through because she grew up in the South with this very sort of traditional family and isn't sure that her family will accept her for who she is now or accept Cassidy. And so it's a lot of her kind of working through all of that so that she can be confident in her own identity and also be confident and happy in her relationship with Cassidy. And then on Cassidy's part, this is a woman who is very open about her sexuality but has issues with like intimacy and romance in that yeah she sleeps around a lot, like a lot a lot, She's <laughs> she is notorious for it but she's not one to really let people into her life as like romances and as people that she's in love with. And so in order to be happy with Katie, she needs to work through those issues as well. But it is essentially the story about these two women having to work through their demons in order to make a relationship work. And I liked that. And I personally really liked the romance between the two of them. I thought there was the right level of steam. And I'm saying that knowing that the book does sort of use the fade to black situation, but there was still steam to be had despite that. And I really enjoyed it. I ended up giving this book four stars. I really enjoyed it, but there were a couple things that I picked up on and that seemed to have been issues for other people when I looked back at the reviews as well and I feel like I should make you guys aware of them. The first and my main quibble with this book is that at no time is Katie ever described as bisexual or does that option for her come up sort of in her internal like dialogue. She never considers the fact that maybe she's not straight or a lesbian, maybe she is bisexual. Like they don't discuss that avenue and I think that's a missed opportunity here. The other thing was that even as I was reading this book it felt like they were utilizing a lot of stereotypes and so that kind of bothered me. I kind of feel like it could have been a little bit more nuanced and those were some of the complaints that I did see on Goodreads as well. So those are the two reasons that this ended up being a four star read for me instead of a five. The last book that I read for Pride was Let's Get Back to the Party by Zach Salee and this was actually the book that I read for my work book club. At the time that I filmed my June TBR there was a poll up so I didn't know which way we were gonna go but this ended up being the book and I feel like it's a fairly 
fairly new release. I want to say it came out in maybe February, March, April, around that time. And this is a story that kind of takes place at a very interesting moment in U.S. history. So the book is kind of bookended by the Supreme Court ruling in favor of same-sex marriages and then is ends essentially at the time of the Pulse shooting in Miami. So it's kind of between those two events. And the book is about these two characters, Sebastian and Oscar, that they knew each other from their childhood, but throughout adulthood they haven't really had much contact, and the last time they saw each other was 10 years ago from the start of this book. And they end up bumping into each other at this wedding for a gay couple because the gay couple can now get married because the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriages were legal. And this is a really interesting book about these two characters, but the perspectives of the two characters couldn't be more, like, different. And in the case of Sebastian, here is this man who has recently come out of a relationship is kind of, and is kind of shook from it. and. He really has a somewhat obsessive personality and is also very jealous that like his students, one student in particular, is comfortable with his sexuality enough to be out in high school. Like he, he is somewhat jealous of the fact that this teenager can have a boyfriend and hold hands with his boyfriends and be out to his classmates and for the most part be accepted and be accepted by the school who even encourages this like LGBTQ plus club and encourages them to like march in the pride parade. And so he is very jealous of this. He wants sort of that security of a like long-term romance and marriage and kind of that white picket fence dream. On the other side of the spectrum you have Oscar who actually seems to be put off by the fact that queer culture is becoming more and more like mainstream. He thinks that gay men who marry are kind of like selling out. He thinks the same thing of gay couples who end up adopting or having children. He idolizes this like older generation of gay men who were almost rebels because they were out and because they were like just being themselves and celebrating their queerness and all of that, he idolizes this sort of like fringe counterculture that once existed that is slowly but surely disappearing. Oscar and his perspective were the most interesting part of the book because I honestly had never even considered this. It kind of opened my eyes to this perspective. I do think it raised a lot of interesting questions. Um, and so I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I ended up giving this book three stars because for me the writing style and I just didn't necessarily get along all that much. Um, I there's, there's a lot going on here. You have the change in POV between Sebastian and Oscar. You have the fact that sometimes you're like in these flashbacks or looking back at different times over the course of their histories. Um, and then the one that really sort of bothered me is that there would be this change in form or format where in some parts of the book, like quotations and conversation were in quotation marks as you would traditionally expect, but then at other times they were just not there and it would be more of a he said, she said, they said, we said sort of situation. And I could never figure out what triggered that change, which bothered me a little. I'm glad that I read the book, like, don't get me wrong, I think this was so interesting. It's just a case of like, for me, this isn't necessarily a writing style that I would normally be drawn to on my own. So I'm glad that this is the book that was picked for the book club because probably I wouldn't have picked this up otherwise, but yeah. This was a three star for me just because the writing style isn't what I'm particularly drawn to in a story. The next book is one that I also read for my work book club, but this was our May book. Now, because of the Memorial Day weekend, we didn't actually meet 
until like the end of the first week of June, which means that I did not get to read the book until June 1st. But the book is Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu, and it is essentially the satire that looks at the stereotypes of Asian characters in Hollywood in particular. And the entire book is written like a screenplay. Um, and what I mean by that is, yeah. Um, but the main character is this man, Willis, who is working these sort of generic Asian casting jobs in Hollywood, but he aspires to be the kung fu guy because he sees that kind of as like the pinnacle of what Asian men in Hollywood are capable of doing. And so it is this look at all of these stereotypes over the course of like Willis working through Hollywood and slowly working his way up the ranks to eventually get to this kung fu guy role. And it's a really interesting book, like very, very interesting. I think the style of the writing because of the screenplay is really interesting, but I could definitely see where some people might find it gimmicky. It didn't really bother me, but that's because I am accustomed to reading plays and even screenplays, so it's a familiar formatting choice for me. So it didn't bother me all that much. I do think that this is a really important read. Is it a book, though, that I would necessarily read for a second time? Probably not. There were things about it that kind of threw me, and I was really trying to like follow it but at times I couldn't understand the differentiation between what was actually happening in Willis's like real life offset and what was happening on set and at times I feel like there was this weird blending that kind of bordered on like maybe even magical realism. Um, I do think overall that that was probably intentional because the feeling I got at the end of this was that like interior Chinatown as the name is kind of like creating a set piece out of Willis's experience. Like his world is essentially a like sound. His, his life is effectively a sound stage at like some big movie studio or whatever the case may be. So I think it was intentional, but it was kind of a bit jarring and not something that I particularly enjoyed. Despite all of that, <laughs> I did end up giving this book four stars because I do think that it had some really important things to say about xenophobia and about the racism that Asian Americans experience in the US and also towards the end of the book like it calls out these various laws that have been put on the books throughout US history that have discriminated against Asians and Asian Americans that I had never been like made aware of in all of my years of schooling and it was like a really powerful wow moment so because it was able to do that, I ended up giving it four stars. Like, it seriously made me think, like I said, this isn't a book that I would potentially reread, but I do think it's a book that is worth at least one read for everyone. Moving right along to the next set of books that I read that were for the Romance-a-thon. And to be honest, I think that I read the lion's share of these books after the Romance-a-thon had already ended. Yeah. I'm a fail. Moving on. Anyway, um, so the first book that I want to talk about is Get a Life, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. I am so late to this party. Like, so late. All three books in the trilogy are out. Everyone has been gushing about each and every one of them. So yes, I am very, very late to this party train, party bus, whatever you want to call it. I'm just late. But I really, really, really enjoyed this book. I think 
that if I had read this last year around the same time that I read The Kiss Quotient, it would have had the same effect. Like it would have opened the entire romance genre to me because it was just so lovable, so cute. I, it, it was great. Like I just had such a fun time. I listened to it as an audiobook and that's kind of really the one like quibble I had with this is because the audiobook is narrated by it is narrated by the actress who plays Lady Danbury in Bridgerton. So it is this gorgeous older woman voicing a like character that is my age and I was just like that is a choice. That is definitely a choice. <laughs> So that was just a little bit weird. Like there was some disconnect with the audiobook because of that experience. But the book was just so fun. So the main character, the couple, there's Chloe who is from this wealthy family and she has basically created this list of things that she wants to do in order to get a life. One of the first ones is like to move out of her family's house. It's kind of like a bucket list type situation. And then there is Redford, who is the man that takes care of the apartment building that she is now living in now that she's moved out of their house. And this is like an enemies to lover type situation. Like both of them rankle each other and get on each other's nerve, but the two of them end up having a romance partly because Redford becomes involved in helping her to check off various things on this list of hers that she has created. And it's a romance, so they end up falling in love. And it's just great. I think I realized in reading this book that I do really enjoy the enemies to lover trope in romance because that's what's going on here and I did really love it. And just the two of them like the steam, when it gets to the steam, oh my, like it was yes, 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 I loved it, loved to see it, it was fantastic. Um, but yeah, the relationship between the two of them was just great. I think the supporting characters were also great. You get to kind of see little bits and pieces of her two sisters who are the focuses of the other two books. Her grandmother, who I believe is supposed to be this like West Indian woman, She's just fabulous. I love her. Can we have a book focused on her because she's brilliant? And it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Like this is one of those books that was just pure enjoyment and I loved it. I also love the fact that the book has this um, chronic illness representation because Chloe suffers with fibromyalgia and so she's kind of constantly in pain and it was actually great to see the way that Redford handled learning about this and sort of seeing how she also handled being in pain and what she could cope with and what she couldn't. So I really liked that aspect of it as well. So I did end up giving it 4.5 stars. I think honestly if I had read the book in its physical format without Lady Danbury as the narrator it probably would have been a five star for me. But alas, it's fine. I do want to read the next two books in the series, so those have quickly moved up to the top of my TBR list. <laughs> okay, so the next set of books that I want to talk about are the books that I decided to read as part of like this historical romance reading blog that I decided to do which at the time that this is going live, I don't think that has gone live, so it's coming. But anyway, the first book that I want to talk about is Mr. Malcolm's List by Suzanne Allen? Elaine? Anyway, it is a Regency romance and it's about this Mr. Malcolm, Jeremy, who has created a list for himself of like attributes that he requires his future wife to have. And as he's like courting women, if they don't live up to his standards, they get the boot. Well, he gives the boot to the wrong person. This character, Julia, is pissed to find out that first of all, 
Jeremy has a list. Second of all, she doesn't live up to his expectations. So she comes up with this like really intricate, that's the word I'm looking for, intricate plan to basically beat Jeremy Malcolm at his own game. And she brings a childhood friend of hers, Selena's, to London effectively to have Selena show herself to have all of the traits that Mr. Malcolm is looking for in a wife, win him over, and then be like, oh, sorry, actually, you don't meet my criteria for a husband, and blow him off that way. Like, she wants eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth sort of revenge. Like, she wants to get him back for this. However, Selena and Jeremy kind of hit it off. Like, things are good, and it, it, things just happen. There's a lot of hijinks involved, and it, it is bingeable. Like, I basically binged this book. Um, it is fairly short as an audiobook. Um, I think as a physical book, it's around 200 pages, so it's really not long. Um, but this for me was kind of a, like, low three star. Like, there was nothing offensive about it, but I really wish that there had been more character development. Um, I wish there had been some steam, like this book had zero steam, like the most you get are a couple kisses, like very PG for a romance book, if I do say so myself. So that was kind of a letdown. Um, but I mean, my main thing was that there really wasn't much character development. I don't, like, Julia as kind of this antagonistic character, like, she, her character changes completely from the first half of the book to the second half of the book. She could be two entirely different people. And I didn't feel like there was much depth to either Selena or Jeremy. So unfortunately, it wasn't a great reading experience. You can get a little bit more detail into the goings on of the book if you watch my reading vlog that eventually will be on my channel. But yeah, so this was like a low three star. There, as I said, there was nothing offensive to make it like a two or 2.5 star rating for me, but it just wasn't enough in my opinion. And the next book is A Lady's Guide to Mischief and Mayhem by Amanda Collins. And this was just delightful. Like I had so much fun. It was so cute. There was steam, which I was like, thank you. Because after Mr. Malcolm's list, I was a little frustrated. Like I needed someone to let off steam. And thankfully, this entered my life. Anywho, it is a Victorian romance with like this murder mystery element to it and it also happens to be like an enemies to lover type romance which as I told you earlier I'm beginning to realize I really like. Like I like that tension but essentially Lady Catherine is a female journalist and she's written an article on a murder that has taken place that leads to an arrest. Detective Andrew is none too thrilled because essentially the article is what gets him demoted and he blames Catherine for that. Meanwhile, Catherine blames him for having not solved the murder in the first place and having not interviewed the witness that she interviewed for the article. And so they're not in each other's good books. But when another murder takes place, they end up crossing paths again. And it's a romance, so things heat up and it was great. So I wouldn't necessarily say that this is like a straight forward romance because I do think the murder mystery and everything that's going on there is actually quite prevalent in a large chunk of the book. But the way that the romance is woven into it, I really enjoyed. I liked those two characters together. Um, I also feel like of the three books that I read for this historical romance reading vlog. This is one that if you are a fan of the E.V. Dunmore books that you will probably enjoy as well because of Lady Catherine's stances on 
various elements of being a Victorian woman and kind of this like feminist vibe that is going on with her character. But yeah, it was just a lot of fun. I had a really good time. And again, if you want more details into why I loved it as much as I did, make sure you watch the reading vlog. I'm gonna keep shamelessly plugging that reading vlog. My apologies. But yeah, this was a four star read for me. I really, really enjoyed it. And then the final book that I read for that reading vlog was A Lady's Formula for Love by Elizabeth Everett, which was another Victorian historical romance. And in this one, the main character, Lady Violet, has formed this like secret society of female scientists in Victorian England. And basically, it's where all of these women who are really into the natural sciences can come to conduct their experiments without having to worry about how like the the world the society at large views them like they can come here and study and do their experiments in peace and lady violet's eventual love interest is arthur who is her bodyguard and he's brought onto the scene by all people her stepson because Lady Violet is doing something for the crown, she's on some sort of mission, and because of that there are like people trying to kill her or sabotage her work, so Arthur's there to protect her as this like counter assassin. And sparks fly. Um, and the book itself is really cute, it's interesting, but I really wanted more from it. Like the attraction between these two characters is almost instantaneous. And I don't know that I necessarily bought what was being sold to me. Like it's almost too instantaneous and things just kind of evolve really quickly between them. I also just overall wasn't necessarily in love with the world that was being developed, but I will say that the one thing I really liked about this book is that it's big on consent. Like Arthur's big thing is that he wants Violet to tell him what she wants and what she doesn't want in bed, and it's all about her being comfortable telling him what she wants and what she needs. But yeah, I don't necessarily know that I liked the writing enough, the characters enough, the world enough to read the second book in the series that I think is supposed to be coming out either in 2022 or 2023. Like this wasn't as much of a win for me as the Amanda Collins one was. So it ended up being three stars, it was okay, like sometimes you just need a little bit of fun and escapism and this definitely delivered that, but it was kind of just okay, kind of mediocre in my opinion. <laughs> Moving right along to the next book and the next reading vlog that also is not up on my channel yet, we're gonna talk Voyager by Diana Gabaldon, which is the third book in the Outlander series that I just just managed to finish on the last day in June. Thank you very much. It is a really big book. It is like over a thousand pages, um, but I was reading this partly for the Romance-a-thon and partly for the Olympic Readathon, which was the other readathon I was like unofficially participating in because I didn't meet the registration deadline for it. Um, but I really enjoyed this book. I ended up giving it a 4.5 star rating on Goodreads because I did really have a lot of fun with it. It kind of has a bit of everything, like it has action and adventure. It has the like historical fiction elements of like the well-researched past that I am really drawn to. It has the like firework inducing romance between Jamie and Claire that is just like steamy and smutty and just wonderful and I love it. I love them as a, a couple. They are my OTP so you get lots of them. There are pirates and shipwrecks and a seafaring voyage which 
in that order it should have come first before the pirates and before the shipwrecks um there's marriage there's just there's just a lot going on and I really really enjoyed it for me it's great to continue to be in Jamie and Claire's world to see their relationship continuing to grow and develop as they reunite with one another and um get to kind of live together now knowing that Claire is there to stay and that she's not going to leave him again and so it's really good to see I had a ton of fun with it um, I do have a very spoilery reading vlog for this one coming so I'm not gonna belabor the point but I think that if you enjoy the first book and the second book or even just one of those books that you will likely enjoy this as well because it has a lot of the same things going on a lot of the same elements a lot of the same characters that you can really enjoy and I do think that the like supporting characters are beginning to really have lives of their own and be more fully fleshed out which would really be my only quibble with I want to say book two I feel like characters were introduced and just kind of there in the background now they're beginning to have more more meat on their bones for lack of a better like expression or term but yeah i really enjoyed this and if you've read it check out my spoilery reading vlog because you'll get all my thoughts but yeah this was this was really fun and so i'm looking forward to reading drums of autumn which is book four in july so there will be a reading vlog for that one as well and the last book my friends is probably one of the easiest five star ratings i have ever given a book catherine the great by robert k massey which is a biography on catherine the great of russia and let me tell you something this is a masterpiece it is beautifully written and so interesting and a page turner even though it is a biography and it is nonfiction and usually page turner is not the word that I would use to describe a biography or nonfiction but it is um, and I just really really love this I am so glad that I finally got around to it because this book has appeared on multiple TBRs since the beginning of the year and I had never gotten around to it and now I am so upset that I hadn't read it sooner because I absolutely loved it. Now generally speaking I prefer to read biographies on historical women that are written by female authors and that's partly because there is this like history of male historians using the like person of interest sexuality as like a weapon to make them seem immoral or to call into question their judgment or behavior um, over the course of their lives like there 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 is that habit and I'm glad to say that that is not the case with this biography I feel like Robert K Massey handled Catherine the Great with immense care taking into account that there are a lot of rumors that have been spread about her over the course of the last few centuries that have tried to use her sexuality to delegitimize everything that she accomplished in her life and I think he handled it beautifully but this is the biography of Catherine the Great and it is just this sweeping epic story of her life starting out from when she was kind of this lowly German born princess who ends up through like the machinations of her mother and others marrying the future Tsar of Russia it goes through kind of her transition from this German princess to this Russian Grand Duchess and what that means and how she embraces Russian culture the language the religion and wins over the love of the people so much so that she ends up ascending to the throne as the Tsarina of Russia with a coup like that's how she comes to power there is a coup she 
basically usurps the throne from her husband, who is, to be honest, a deadbeat and a ninny. Um, but she usurps the throne from him and then rules Ru Russia for however many years. And it's just, it's just great to hear about this woman who, truth be told, she was like an enlightened despot, but she had a lot of these, um, humanist ideas that she had learned and read from a lot of the sort of French philosophers that she truly admired. It talks a lot about her accomplishments during her time there with the different wars, with building a, a Russia into this like empire with art and culture and all of these other things. It talks a lot about her relationship with the men in her life, especially Potemkin, who is a really interesting character historically, and it was just really well done. Like, there was so much about her life personally that I learned from this book that I had not known previously, and I do think that this is a book that if you don't know anything about Russian history or this particular time period, that it does a really, really good job of providing enough context that you understand what is happening in Russia, but what is also happening outside of Russia that is impacting Catherine's choices and what's going on there. So yes, this was one of the easiest five-star reviews I have ever given. I loved it, and I know I'm gonna end up rereading this at some point because I just loved it that much. It also made me really want to rewatch the HBO series Catherine the Great starring Helen Mirren, which I haven't done yet, but maybe I'll do it this weekend because it is a long weekend, so that's a possibility. But yes, this just reaffirmed my love of Catherine the Great. She was always a historical girl crush, but now it's like a full-fledged love affair here. So yeah, those are the books that I read in June, and there were some standouts. We're talking Catherine the Great, Carol, Voyager. We can't forget A Lady's Guide to Mischief and Mayhem, because that was, that was a bop, for lack of a better term. Like, oh, Chloe Brown, also a bop. Like, there were a lot of really fun and interesting reads for me this month. I had a load of fun. Um, but certainly let me know if you've read any of these books, what your thoughts were on them. If you now want to read any of these books, let me know. But I do hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Bye!